motivation for this paper is thinking about uh, government bond yields in the aftermath of the Great Recession. So several people have documented, they've fallen considerably since uh, 2008, 2009, and perhaps more interestingly, they have remained persistently low. And uh, the explanation of the story we're gonna kind of pursue in this paper is that the Great Recession was an unusual event in the context of the US economy, and observing an unusual event changes agents' beliefs about tail events, about similar events recurring in the future. And this change in their beliefs is going to have persistent effects on the return they require from safe and liquid assets. So we're gonna argue that this story lines up quite well with the data, it's quantitatively qu quite powerful, it's consistent with uh, evidence from equity and other markets, um, and I'm gonna try and show you the ingredients that are necessary uh, to make this story kind of stick. Okay, so that's kind of the plan for the next 15 minutes, or 17 minutes. So here are the key ingredients of the paper. So the central premise, the basic idea that we're gonna start with is that agents don't know the true distribution of aggregate shocks, but are gonna estimate that distribution in real time as they see new data. So that's gonna be the standard, or that's perhaps the new piece, um, uh, in, or that's the central new piece uh, in our analysis. The approach we take to beliefs is going to be slightly unusual, but nothing terribly non-standard. We're going to uh, assume that agents learn about these dis this distribution in a non-parametric fashion. That's going to give a meaningful dimension to this notion of tail risk, the likelihood of extreme adverse events distinct from uncertainty, which is kind of more a second moment uh, type of object. Uh, so that's part one of our, um, of our belief estimation uh, strategy. The second is we're gonna try and use observable macro data, uh, aggregate data, to discipline uh, <coughs> our statement, our, our conclusions about agents' beliefs. And I'll be much more specific about that and we'll talk more about that in some setting. Right, so that's kind of the, the, the key ingredient. And in that setting, what I'm, what I'm gonna sh try and show you is that a tail event, an event like the Great Recession, which is unusual, is going to induce large changes in agents' beliefs, especially in the likelihood they attach to tail events, to negative to events in the left tail. Um, already? <laughs> um, <coughs> So um, perhaps more importantly, apart from the fact that it changes beliefs by a lot, these changes are going to be extremely long-lasting, long even when the underlying shocks are transitory. So their, their effects on uh, economic outcomes are going to outlast the transitory effects of the shock. And that's where the persistence is going to come from. Right? So that's going to be a key part of our analysis uh, today. Right? So that's kind of the mechanism. That's what's new, perhaps, from our perspective uh, in our analysis. So we're gonna embed that in a fairly standard economic environment uh, to kind of quantify the effects of uh, this mechanism for interest rates, which is the focus in this paper. Um, and one key, op you know, we're gonna add a bunch of things that are necessary perhaps for quantitative um, relevance. And one of the key ingredients is going to be liquidity constraints. So these, the safe asset, the riskless asset in our economy is also going to provide liquidity services and the change in tail risk will interact with that liquidity provision uh, in an interesting way. So we're gonna come back to that uh, when I get to the mechanism. So the upshot of all that is that the observing an event like the, tail, uh, the Great Recession is going to lead to a large and persistent drop in riskless rates. So in our, under our calibration, that's about 1.45%. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna show you that the model's implications for things like options prices are actually consistent with the data in a particular way. So I'll, uh, I'll talk more about that when I get to the results. So that's the plan of action for the next, uh, for, this, for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let me kind of spend a little bit of time on the belief formation, the new piece here, and I'll, and I'll go through quickly the, the economic environment because I wanna to get to the results. All right, so think about agents trying to estimate an unknown distribution G of an IID shock process. So they know the shock is IID, they just don't know the distribution it's drawn from. They have a finite history of shock realizations um, and they're trying to fit, fit this distribution. So as I said at the beginning, our goal is a relatively flexible specification that's both tractable, but it also can capture changes in tail risk and not just parametric changes in, uh, in, in second moments. And the approach we're gonna take is we're gonna do a very standard non-parametric estimation 
the Gaussian kernel density. And here is the form of the Gaussian kernel density. Um, the parameter kappa indexes the, the bandwidth of the, of the kernel. Uh, and it basically just, uh, just, rather than kind of dwell on this formula, let me show you an example about how this works. Most of you in this room should be very familiar, so this shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, but it's useful to kind of just highlight uh, exactly how this is going to work. So on the left is the kernel density estimated on this finite sample. Um, and um, you know, so the blue bars are the actual observed frequency distribution, the histogram. The kernel essentially just draws a nice smooth line through that. And kappa is basically controlling how smooth that line has to be. Right? So after you see a tail event, and the tail event here is going to be those you know, a, a really bad realization some, about 0.85 and a really bad one around 0.93. As you can see, they are well outside the, the realm of the, dis, uh, the realizations before such an event. So how does the kernel deal with that? The kernel basically kind of, you know, it takes a little bit of the mass away from here and shifts it there and draws a smooth PDF uh, all the way through. Right? So that's going to be the updated belief. It's a little bit more pessimistic, and in a, in a particular way, it's going to have more mass in the left tail, and that's where all the action, uh, uh, and that's what's going to de deliver all the action uh, in the model. So this is about how beliefs change. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, what we are perhaps more interested in is why, uh, how persistent are these belief changes. Um, so let me try and highlight that, you know, again, using the same example. So, you know, so this is g hat t estimated after the tail event uh, has been realized. So, you know, we're, let's say we kind of take this economy forward for another, you know, 30 years, and let's see what happens to beliefs in this, uh, in this setting, right? So uh, now we have to take a stand on where we are going to draw time paths for this economy from. If you kind of simulate this economy by drawing from g hat t, the updated dis, uh, estimate of the agent's distribution. In other words, we're putting ourselves in the shoes of the agents and asking what is the be our best guess for sh uh, where shocks are going to come from. Um, then this setting has a kind of martingale property. So the martingale property here holds approximately. So the idea that beliefs uh, on average uh, out in the future are going to be the same as beliefs today. Right? So that's where, that's, that already kind of tells you a, fair, a very strong uh, result about persistence, that these belief changes are going to stick around for a long time, at least on average. Right? So that's one, ex that's one point I want to make. The second, you could also say, let's, let's try and simulate beliefs under an alternative world where the, where the crisis, the one, the tail event that we observed, was actually a freak event. We're never going to see anything like this again. It just, we just happen to see one. So eventually we're going to kind of, you know, forget about it. We're going to essentially, that's going to, the effect of that on beliefs is eventually going to uh, uh, disappear. However, you know, when you do this in this kind of non-parametric fashion, that the pace at which these, these beliefs get whittled down is actually very, very slow. So, you know, even after 30 years, the, that bump that you saw on the previous graph is still very noticeable, even though agents have never seen another crisis uh, in, that, in that interim. So eventually this bump will disappear, but the pace is going to be very, very slow. So both of these things kind of underscore the idea that these belief changes, belief changes about things that happen, that uh, the unusual stuff that happens all the way out left uh, are extremely persistent. Right? So that's going to be a key part of uh, what we're going to find later. OK, so now let me kind of quickly walk you through what the ingredients of the economic model are. Nothing here should be you know, particularly surprising. Uh, I'm happy to get into more details if the discussants have comments on that. So it's going to be a production economy. Uh, this is the production function with capital and labor. Um, the only shock in the model is going to be what we're going to call a shock to aggregate capital quality. So it's something which scales up the effective capital available for production uh, in this economy. Right? And that's the shock fee. Uh, the shock is known to be IID, but the distribution is what's unknown, and that's what agents are going to learn about. So uh, this is the only shock in this model, and I'll tell you how we're going to use data to construct a time series for the shock uh, in, in, in a second. Okay? There's going to be a representative household, which is going to give us a stochastic discount factor with standard preferences, um, and then uh, the liquidity piece. So these firms, apart from this production activity, they're also going to have another profitable investment opportunity, an intra-period investment opportunity, which is going to require liquidity. So this is the simplest way to kind of build in a need, a motive for liquidity uh, in this economy. So what they can invest in this project, X, is constrained by how much liquidity they have. 
that liquidity is a function of gov the supply of government bonds, which is what B here is, and uh, a fraction, eta, of the effective capital uh, that, uh, that the economy has. So since this is effective capital, you can kind of see how uh, the distribution of the shock process affects uh, what agents think uh, their liquidity needs would be, or how, or how agents value the liquidity provided by this. So as is usually standard, you're going to get a pretty simple expression for the risk-free rate, which is going to depend on the stochastic discount factor, but is also going to encode a liquidity premium, which depends on how binding or how tight this constraint is. So that's going to be, uh, we're going to quantify how much tail risk changes this liquidity premium uh, uh, in our results. Okay, so that's, uh, that's essentially the, these are all fairly standard ingredients, uh, in, in, at least in modern macro. Uh, to that, we are going to append our new piece, this idea that this belief distribution G is going to be estimated by agents in real time. So at each point in time, we're going to feed in macro data, and that's going to spit out an observable belief, uh, sorry, that's going to spit out an estimated belief uh, G hat uh, underscore T. Right? In order to do that, I need to first figure out how to construct a series for the shock fee, um, and that's what I'm going to turn to next. Okay? Um, the idea there is uh, the interpretation of the shock, um, uh, to, or the mapping of the shock to the data, is that effective capital maps to the market value of capital in, in the U.S. economy, non-residential capital in the U.S. economy. And so to construct the series, we're basically going to use the flow of funds, which reports um, the market value of non-residential uh, assets used by non-financial corporations in the U.S. Uh, and so the, looking at that data through the lens of the model, there's a very transparent way to extract a time series for this fee. So essentially, fee is going to capture fluctuations in the market value of real estate and commercial real estate and other assets uh, in, the, in, the, in the economy. Right? So that's, what, that's what's going to give us the fee, and through that kernel estimation process, that's going to give us the, the estimated belief process, uh, G hat T, and I'll show you that in a second. The rest of the uh, calibration is pretty standard, nothing particularly controversial. Risk aversion is kind of low. Uh, we're going to have uh, some, uh, we're going to calibrate the liquidity parameter so that it uh, delivers a risk-free rate of 2% before the crisis. Right? Uh, so that's how uh, that part of the economy is going to be pinned down, and then I'll show you what happens once you see this, right? So on the left panel here is the time series of that measured fee shock, measured exactly as I discussed on the previous slide, right? So it's kind of, you know, somewhat stable here. It bounces around a little bit, and then you get these really bad negative realizations. So about, you know, 93 or something percent here, and point in about 83 uh, percent in 2009. These are the two negative realizations, and they're going to induce exactly the type of change in the belief distribution that I showed you in that simple example. In fact, that simple example made use of exactly the same, uh, uh, the same idea, the same series. Right? So that's where that, that, that's our notion of increased tail risk. Uh, and what I'm going to show you now is what this tail risk does to interest rates uh, uh, and liquidity premia in this economy. Right? So that's our, uh, this is, these are our estimated beliefs. The blue line is the pre-crisis belief, and the red line, red dashed line, is the post-crisis uh, estimate. So here is the thought experiment, and I'll show you a bunch of results. We're going to start the economy off at the steady state associated with, the, with, with G hat 2007. So stochastic steady state, so a long run average estimated using data through 2007. And then we're going to feed in uh, the actual shocks, estimate G hat 2009, and then simulate time paths for this economy, uh, drawing from this new updated distribution G hat 2009. Uh, and I'll show you what the average response of this economy, uh, or, or the average change in interest rates, uh, averaging over all these uh, draws. And then later today, I'll just, uh, at the end, I'll show you what happens if you simulate time paths conditioning on something like 2008, 2009 never recurring again. So we're just going to condition on paths where there are no more crises uh, in the future. And I'll show you how uh, or what changes, if any. Okay, so that's our basic ex uh, main exercise. So here's what happens to interest rates um, in the economy, right? So the blue line uh, is our baseline model. That's, the, that's, our, that's kind of the model with learning. For comparison, the green dashed line is the same model uh, with the learning mechanism turned off. You know, it's kind of the standard rational expectations assumption where we assume that agents know the distribution of shocks hitting the economy from the very beginning. 
right? So nothing, they see the bad shock, but their beliefs don't change because they know what the true distribution is, right? So the difference between these two things is essentially the contribution of learning uh, to the story, right? So uh, what happens uh, when, you, when the negative shock hit, you know, there's much less capital, much less liquidity, you know, all of this leads to a big drop in the interest rate, a fairly substantial one, um, and then, but the economy slowly recovers back. Uh, the, the green line basically goes back to the steady state, you know, by the end of this time period, it's well, you know, it's almost, uh, it's practically back to where it was at the beginning. The speed of this, this the, the reason it's a slow adjustment is because capital takes time to accumulate or replenish. Um, the, the blue line shows a somewhat similar pattern, but as you can see, it's kind of going to a new lower steady state. So the new pes the pessimism induced by the learning mechanism takes the economy to a lower uh, to a new steady state with lower amounts of capital, lower amounts of output, and importantly, significantly lower interest rates. Right. So that's kind of the main um, uh, punchline here. Just for comparison, the red dashed or the red circles are data using one-year real rates, just to kind of give a sense for how much the change was uh, over the same time period. Um, so this idea, so this thing here, this economy is converging to a long run steady state. And um, I'll, let me kind of quickly show you what the, the, the end results are there, uh, because I have five minutes left. So like I, as I mentioned, the, lo the, the model predicts that in the long run, interest rates, are, riskless interest rates are going to be 1.45% lower. And here we collected a bunch of estimates for how much long run interest rates have, or interest rates both short and long run have changed. And you know, this is kind of in the right ballpark uh, in terms of how much the changes are. Uh, we'll talk more about this hopefully after the discussion if there are any questions. Uh, second, we kind of, to quantify how much of it comes from liquidity, uh, this is what, uh, this is an exercise where we kind of just isolate the component that's coming from liquidity. And under our calibration, almost all of this change comes from the liquidity premium. Uh, perhaps not altogether surprising, we started out with a very, very modest amount of risk aversion. Uh, and uh, so liquidity does you know, a, a disproportionate amount of the, of the heavy lifting here. And the intuition of the mechanism is what I highlighted earlier. You know, once you are more slightly more pessimistic about capital, uh, about returns to capital, you accumulate less capital. And more importantly, capital now is a worse supplier of liquidity. Because right when uh, the adverse shock hits, that's when you really need liquidity, and that's when capital actually under delivers on liquidity. So that the combination of those effects make the liquidity premium on bonds go through the roof. And that's essentially what's explaining much of the drop in the, in the, in the rate of return on, on risk response. All right, so that's one. Uh, a quick comment on, on equity prices, and I conclude. Um, so this here we do, we kind of interpret equity as a levered value, a levered claim on the value of the firm, and price various equity related objects. The only point I want to make here, this is not exactly, this is not intended to be a model of equity prices, so I don't want to push this too hard. I just want to explain that in fact the model actually predicts that equity prices don't really fall off a cliff even though tail risk has gone up a lot. So in a sense, the fact that equity prices have run up, the model cannot really match the huge run up in equity prices, but the fact, it's not like it's predicting a precipitous fall uh, either. What is true is if you actually use this notion of equity to price options, and construct measures of tail risk from traded options on, 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 uh, on the S&P 500, the model's predictions are actually quite, line up quite nicely with the data. So the third moment, or the probability of a, of a return realization 30% below the mean, are almost, the change in those objects is almost exactly what you saw, uh, what you see in the data over this time period. Right, my last slide. Um, so that's what, so this is the sense in which I want to kind of underscore that the, this hypothesis of increased tail risk is broadly consistent with evidence from equity markets, and in particular those on, from, uh, on, on options. So my last slide, um, as I told you, one, the, the, experiment, the, the analysis I showed you so far, we were drawing future shocks from the updated belief distribution. Um, here we're going to do the same thing, uh, but drawing from the pre-crisis distribution. So, the perspective here is that the 2008-2009 event were a freak you know, occurrence. We are never going to see something like this again. So eventually, this is going to wash itself out of agents' beliefs. But how fast does that happen? And so the panel on the right, the panel on the left is exactly what I showed you earlier. The panel on the right is this with the new, uh, with the new distribution. And so as you can see, there, in what, by the end of this period, it was about 150 basis points. Here, the drop in interest rates relative to the pre-crisis level is about 100 basis points. 
So if I kept extending this, this is going to go to zero. But this at least kind of gives us a sense that this, re this reversion back to normal can take a very, very long time. Right? So that's the sense in which you know, uh, there is something about this mechanism that's a very powerful uh, mechanism for persistence, a powerful propagation mechanism. So that's, uh, with that, I'm going to conclude and turn it over to the discussants. So the basic premise is, you know, I want to underscore, is this idea, we're going to start from this idea that no one, none of us in the room, agents in the real world, nobody knows the true distribution, uh, but are constantly in the game of figuring out what it is. And in some sense, that's what, uh, that idea modeled in a way that, is, that treats tail events somewhat differently from normal events uh, is a, is, gives us a new perspective on what persistence in, uh, after events like the Great Recession can come from. <laughs>